Oh, hey, let's go over chapter six, volcanoes and other igneous activity. So volcanoes involve eruptions of magmatic material. Magma is molten rock. So it's, a, it's essentially liquid rock that contains minerals crystallizing out of it. It also contains uh, gases within it. And we refer to them as dissolved gases. And when magma reaches the surface, it erupts as lava. So that's just the name change that occurs there. And the behavior of magma, which largely influences the nature of the eruption, is dependent on a couple of things. One is the temperature of the magma. The other is the composition. Now, if you remember from composition, think back to igneous rocks. When we go to mafic composition, which means uh, less silica, more mafic minerals, ferromagnesian minerals. And uh, the compositional range goes from that to felsic, which are made up of a lot of light silicates, feldspar, quartz, etc. And then the, the third factor are dissolved gases and, and the amount of gases that are in the magma. And those three factors control viscosity, okay? And that controls the nature of the eruption. And viscosity essentially means resistance to flow. So if magma has high resistance to flow, that usually leads to crazy eruptions like you see here. This is in um, Indonesia. And this, uh, I think this is um, Mount Cinnabon. That is a crazy eruption, and that pyroclastic flow could incinerate you. Just think of that scene in Terminator 2 where Sarah Connor's hanging on to the chain link fence, and then the bomb goes off, and she turns into a skeleton. And <laughs> just imagine that. Yeah, that, that's what will happen. You see that? She kicked off her sandals, and she's running for her life. That's a, a violent eruption. So viscosity is a measure of a material's resistance to flow. So uh, compare two things. Let's say you have a full glass of water and a full glass of honey, and you pour them both upside down. Which one's going to flow out faster? The water, right? Water has lower viscosity, less resistance to flow, so it flows at a much faster rate. Honey, on the other hand, will kind of just ooze and drip out, and that's because honey has higher resistance to flow. Okay, And so the factors that affect viscosity, one of the most important factors is temperature. Hotter magmas are less viscous, meaning so hotter magmas can f uh, or hotter lavas can flow farther different distances on the surface of the earth. The same goes for, think of bacon grease. <laughs> bacon grease, um, when you're frying bacon and all the grease kind of comes out, it's really mobile and uh, kind of flows around in, in the uh, skillet, right? And that's because it's really hot. But you ever like, you know, fry up bacon and then you set it aside and let the grease sit for a while. And when it cools down, it kind of congeals into like this weird jelly gross stuff. Um, and that's because it cooled down. So it's viscosity lowered because it cooled down, right? Bacon grease. So take home message, temperature is very important. Hotter magmas, lower viscosity. Uh, lower temperature magmas, higher viscosity. Then composition is a big factor. Um, magmas that have higher silica content, and that's SiO2, they're more viscous. Okay, So rhyolitic or felsic um, magmas, uh, which, which rhyolitic is on the end of that, and then andesitic lavas are kind of in the intermediate composition, they're more viscous. Okay, they kind of stagnate as they move because uh, there's, they have high resistance to flow. Lower silica magmas, like uh, basaltic lavas, they're less viscous, and these are allowed to flow larger distances. Um, and the general reason for this is because, remember when we talked about minerals, uh, there's that silicate structure, the tetrahedra. Um, when you have more silica in your magma, it's going to form more and more of those uh, single tetrahedra. And then if there's a lot of them crystallizing uh, within the magma, they tend to start to link up. They call that polymerization. And they link up and start to slow down the magma. And it kind of 
increases the crystallization process and that causes the higher viscosity. All right, the, the last factor are the dissolved gases. Okay, there's uh, a lot of dissolved gas in magma. Uh, most of it is water vapor. And water vapor specifically reduces the, the viscosity. Um, and the reason it does this is because when you have water within a magma, it actually prevents the silica tetrahedrons from kind of connecting to one another. So it breaks up those chains, which makes the magma more fluid-like, okay? And as magma like approaches the surface of the earth, as it's kind of, kind of meandering its way through the crust, um, the gases expand because of the decreasing in pressure. And the violence of a volcanic eruption is related to how easily those gases can escape from a magma. And if they can escape, which means you have a magma that has really high viscosity, those gases are going to build up until it becomes dangerous, the pressure becomes dangerously high, and then boom, you get a huge eruption. If you have a low viscosity magma that can flow very easily, the gases are kind of allowed to escape and they don't accumulate, so you don't get those violent eruptions, typically. So here's a chart or a table you can look at. Here are the different composition of magmas. Basaltic, which has the least amount of silica, to rhyolitic, which has the most amount of silica. Okay. Um, and here are their eruptive temperatures. Basalt erupts uh, anywhere between 1,000 to 1,250 degrees Celsius. And its high temperatures leads to uh, low viscosity. If you look at rhyolite, that erupts at really low temperatures, 650 to 900 degrees Celsius. Therefore, it has the greatest viscosity. Okay, And what we know uh, is viscosity, or specifically the composition of uh, material being erupted, leads to different styles of volcanic landforms. And we'll talk about that in a second. So there's two, type of erupt two types of eruptions. There are quiescent Hawaiian type eruptions um, where you have very fluid basaltic lavas kind of pouring out onto the landscape. Um, th there, there can be outpourings of these lavas just inundating an entire area just with this fast moving uh, basaltic lava that just solidifies and then becomes rock. Um, and those eruptions can last up to years. Okay, And then there are eruptions that are very violent, explosive eruptions. And those are associated with magmas that have higher viscosity, so uh, almost synonymous with higher silica content in this case. Um, here you see eruptions where you get volcanic fragments being ejected from the uh, vent at really high speeds, gases, glass, um, and f they usually form these eruption columns. There are two YouTube videos here. Uh, I suggest you watch them. They'll show you the two different styles of uh, eruptions. We can also see them here. This would be kind of the Hawaiian style quiescent eruption. Notice that uh, this cone is built up by a black rock. That's basalt that has low uh, viscosity. And so this would be considered a quiescent eruption. This is Volcan Villarica in Chile. Here you can see um, it happened to erupt uh, low viscosity basalt and you can see those flows kind of coming down uh, the volcano. So that's a quiescent eruption. These are more violent, okay? This is where you get those eruption clouds and pyroclastic flows that kind of move downhill, and they can happen suddenly. Do you see how quick this was? Boom, and then all the stuff kind of is activated and comes careening down uh, the volcano as well as kind of upwards. Um, and if you're anywhere near the volcano, um, yeah, you'll be instantly cremated. Okay, so let's talk about lava flows. Um, <coughs> basaltic lavas are very fluid, and they move pretty quickly. Um, you can see that here. There are two types of lava flows. This here is called pahoho, and it resembles braids or ropes. Do you see how those kind of braid or ropey texture starts to form as the lava cools down and crystallizes into basalt? And then there's aa -ah lava. These are Hawaiian terms. Um, and this means rough and jagged blocks. You can see this flow here. This one's a little slower moving. It almost looks like hot coals that you'd have in a grill just kind of creeping uh, down a landscape. Okay, here's some more pictures. Pahoho flow. 
and this is an ah ah flow on top of a pahoho flow. All right, and when this solidifies, this just becomes a, a really hard rock that you can just walk on. Sometimes you have to be careful walking in these landscapes. You might not realize uh, the rock still hasn't completely cooled down, and the bottoms of your shoes could, uh, the soles could start melting, or if you set your bag down or jacket, uh, you could, <laughs> it could start melting. Uh, block lavas are a type of flow uh, that's composed of more silicic rich lava, so andesites or rhyolite. And these flows are very short and prominent. Okay, so uh, because of that high viscosity, they don't flow very far. Uh, then another type of material that's extruded during an eruption are, uh, or can be extruded during eruption are pillow lavas. And these are outpourings of basalt under water or typically under the ocean. And what happens here is that uh, you have flowing basalt and it hits that seawater that's about like two or three degrees Celsius, so it's very cold. And it kind of instantaneously uh, freezes the outside of the lava, but the inside of the lava is still hot and still mobile, so it kind of breaks through and squeezes through the exterior skin. Um, and it forms these tube-like structures, and that's why they call them pillow lavas. See, this is what they look like once they're all done uh, crystallizing. Here's a sketch. This is an actual underwater image of these pillow lavas. And then here's one actual, actually flowing. So you can see how that, uh, see how the outer layer kind of crystallizes instantaneously because of that cold seawater, and then the rest kind of pushes through. So those are pillow lavas. Um, other materials extruded from eruptions, uh, gases. Um, we refer to them as volatiles. Those are the dissolved gases. They can make up anywhere between 1 and 6% of the total weight of the magma. So that's a lot. And as the magma reaches the surface of the earth, the pressure is reduced and the gases expand and escape. So it's kind of like, say you have a champagne bottle, right? Once you pop that cork open, you hear that pop sound. That's the pressure equalizing from the, the, from the uh, champagne itself and the uh, kind of our regular pressure conditions, atmospheric pressure. See, the bottle is under pressure, and that's why you don't really see the uh, carbonation when you're looking at a corked bottle. But once you uh, equalize the pressure and pop the cork, all the gases begin to escape, OK, because you've depressurized the bottle. The composition of the gases. Um, it's mostly water, 70% water, 15% carbon dioxide, and then we have nitrogen and sulfur dioxide. Other materials that are extruded from eruptions include pyroclastic materials. Um, volcanoes often eject uh, rock material or fragments that are pulverized, and a lot of times they can uh, be welded together and shot at really fast rates out of the crater. And these, this material just ranges in size from really fine dust that you can breathe into your lungs. And that's dangerous because a lot of that is uh, liquid uh, lava that crystallized really quickly. So it turns into glass. So you could actually breathe in glass um, to sand-sized ash and then very large rocks. OK, here are the different names for the different size material. Volcanic ash is, is a very fine material. It's very fine. It almost looks like, um, like cigarette ash, but then you can feel it's kind of grainy, and it has glassy fragments in it. Um, lapillis and cinders are pretty close in the same size. Um, cinders are small pea-sized material than lapillis walnut-sized material. Uh, then there are blocks, which are much larger, greater than 2.5 inches in diameter. And then bombs can be ejected from the crater of a volcano. Um, and a lot of times bombs will have a streamlined shape because they kind of crystallize in air as they're being shot out. So I got pictures. Here's the ash, okay, really fine grain. This is the lapilli, okay, just so it almost looks like volcanic gravel. Here's a, a volcanic bomb, and then this is a volcanic block. Other material that can be extruded from a volcano uh, pumice, uh, I don't know if you remember this from our igneous rocks lecture, but pumice is that low-density uh, vesicular felsic volcanic rock. 
Um, has a lot of voids in it. This indicates that it had a lot of gas in it. So it was a kind of frothy eruption. And then there's scoria. Scoria is uh, also a vesicular extrusive um, volcanic rock, uh, but its, uh, its composition is a little closer to basalt. All right, so here's the anatomy of a volcano. Um, a volcano essentially is just kind of like a surface expression of different lava flows that came up to the surface, right? It's just built by successive uh, eruptions and eruptions over time. So um, at first it might be down here, but then there's just a lava flow, lava flow, another one, and then it just builds the structure upwards, okay, with continual uh, lava flows and eruptions and just volcanic material just kind of landing on top of this uh, volcanic feature. And what you'll see here, there's a main magma chamber, okay, that's at depth. There can be more than one. It can be more complex. There can be two magmatic chambers. There can be radiating dikes and sills. So uh, the plumbing can be complex, but at somewhere beneath the surface of the volcano, there is a, an area where a, the majority of magma resides. And then there's a primary uh, conduit that runs to the volcanic ed edifice. Okay, and that brings most of the mag magma towards the surface. And then in, within the edifice, there can be uh, parasitic cones. So basically, um, magma can find an easier pathway to the surface. And you can have lava flows on the side of a volcano. And then the conduit is then connected to the opening at the top of the volcano called the vent. And that's where the eruptions occur. And then there's a rim that surrounds the volcano. And we call that the crater. Okay. So I kind of covered all of this material. If the crater um, uh, exceeds a diameter greater than a kilometer, then we call it a caldera. Okay, so there's just a little name change uh, in case it, the, the crater is larger than a kilometer in diameter. Um, and in these volcanic landscapes, you can often find uh, fumaroles. Those are vents that are or openings in the ground where uh, gases are being emitted. And so sometimes you can see like kind of sulfur accumulating around these fumaroles. Sometimes there's boiling water um, or just kind of just gas kind of shooting up or water vapor. All right, let's talk about the different types of volcanoes. Um, the first type that we'll talk about is a shield volcano. These are very large, broad, and domed volcanoes, okay? Um, and the reason they're kind of built this way, they're not, um, you know, like maybe you built a volcano for like a middle school science project or something um, that's like very conical shape. These are not. These are very flat. I don't know if it's hard to see in this image here, but here is, um, this is Mauna Loa. So you can see that it's not very steep. It's very flat and the increase in elevation is very gradual. Okay, this is the big island of Hawaii right here and it consists of five shield volcanoes. Two are active, Kilauea and Mauna Loa. So this is the big island. Here's Mauna Kea, the highest point, and then these are two other inactive shield volcanoes. And the reason why they're built this way is because of the eruptible products uh, that, uh, um, that erupt. Um, it mostly uh, releases a lot of basaltic and very fluid lava, vast outpourings of this stuff. So you have a magma chamber really close to the surface. Here's the, the summit caldera. Okay, and then you can have a lot of flank eruptions where fluid lava, because of its low viscosity, can flow really far distances. And because it can flow really far distances, then this is what kind of builds up this volcano into this kind of flat, gradual, very large edifice. Okay, um, you can actually, uh, there's a national park uh, at the top of Kilauea, and you can essentially just drive around uh, the crater itself. I mean, I'm sorry, the caldera. It's very flat, so very easy to climb. Um, and also these, because it erupts so much fluid basalt, some of these lava flows will make it all the way out to the ocean. So there are eruptions close to Kilauea that make it all the way to the ocean. Some of them flow as far as 80 kilometers. So that's, and the reason for that is because it erupts basalt, which is very fluid-like, has very low viscosity. And as a result of this low viscosity and the vast outpourings of basalt, these volcanoes are massive. The biggest ones on Earth uh, and the biggest one in our solar system that we found so far is another shield volcano, and that's in 
that's on Mars. That's Olympus Mons. All right, the next type of uh, volcano is a cinder cone. Okay, cinder cone is built from ejected lava. So you have eruption of material that's a little higher in silica. So it has higher viscosity. So it just kind of patters up a lot of kind of uh, lapilli um, and that stuff kind of piles up on top of each other. And it creates a steeper angle. So these are harder, harder to climb. These are also relatively small. Okay, they can occur in kind of clusters um, and they're short lived. Okay, so here's an eruption of some material and then it forms almost like it looks like a fire ant hill. All right, so these are, are much smaller. They can be as, as big as uh, like 300 meters high. It can be smaller than that. And they also, um, like Mauna Loa and Mauna Kea, have eruptions that last like decades. <laughs> Um, these eruptions can be as short as a couple years, and then the volcano goes extinct. So a lot, these are very short-lived. One of the craziest examples is uh, the cinder cone in Paricutin, Mexico. Um, this volcano showed up out of nowhere. In like 1942, uh, this Mexican corn farmer uh, smelled sulfur coming from his fields, and he went out and he saw a, a, a rupture open up in the middle of his farm and he was like dying I don't have volcano insurance went to sleep the next day the thing was at least 30 meters tall in his farm okay it eventually grew to what you see today 300 meters high um, and it had aa flows that inundated the town close by the town of Parangari Kutiro all right that's hard to say okay I've been practicing anyways but Mexican towns um, typically have this kind of architecture where they have a beautiful cathedral in the center of the town with like a park. Um, and here you can see that that still stands and the AA flow kind of uh, went around that entire structure, the biggest structure in town. Um, and it, yeah, everyone had to move. So that was, you know, and this, <laughs> this volcano erupted for nine years and then quit. So it just basically just ruined everyone's day, everyone's uh, decade. Okay, then there are stratovolcanoes. And stratovolcanoes are the ones that you envision in your mind, the one that you kind of built in that, uh, that science project in middle school. These are the, the conically shaped, beautiful volcanoes. Um, they're often uh, painted like, or taken or artists take pictures of. Um, here's one in... Uh, in Japan, Fuji. Um, and most of these composite or stratovolcanoes are adjacent to the Pacific Ocean. And the reason is, is because uh, they're associated with subduction. Um, whenever you have convergent plate boundaries, where you have ocean crusts being subducted into the mantle, uh, then you'll have these uh, composite volcanoes um, arise on the surface of the Earth on the overriding plate. These are larger than cinder cones, but they're still smaller than shield volcanoes, and they're much steeper. If you notice, you can see that these structures are very steep, um, and it makes them quite dangerous because a lot of times the eruptions can be violent and then come down the volcano fairly quickly. In addition to that, a lot of times they can have snow or glaciers on top of that, and if there are eruptions, it can melt that material, and that can bring a lot of volcanic material downhill pretty quickly. And so the way these are built essentially are just eruption after eruption of uh, uh, silicic uh, volcanic material. They can, some composite cones can erupt uh, basalt. A lot of them will erupt andesitic uh, material. Um, <clears throat> but it's just interbedded lavas and pyroclastic flows. And these are the most violent of the volcanoes. And here's a size comparison. Uh, from the three volcano types. Look at these cinder cones. Look how small they are. Bing! Here's a, a composite cone, Mount Rainier in Washington. And that's pretty big. You can see it when you go uh, to Washington in the distance. Nice. You can go up and climb some of the trails around it. Uh, very difficult climb. But look at Mauna Loa in comparison uh, to these two volcanoes. Yeah. Um, shield volcanoes are massive. Okay. This takes into account that uh, Mauna Loa is built from the ocean floor. Okay, so, uh, uh, you know, before the big island became an island, it was kind of a volcano under the ocean. And then successive basaltic 
massive outpourings of basaltic lava just continued to happen, and then boom, it broke sea level and continued to grow. All right, and so if you also notice, its profile is very flat. Okay, so these are huge structures. All right, let's talk about some of the volcanic hazards. I know you guys are excited about this. Okay, the first is Noé Adarnt. That's a French word. I probably butchered it. It's okay. Um, they're produced by composite cones. They're um, fiery, a fiery pyroclastic flow made up of hot gases infused with ash. They can be as hot as like 900 degrees Celsius. The, again, that's instant cremation. Here you can see one kind of coming down Mount Unzen in Japan, um, and that would burn you up, literally. In fact, this eruption killed 45 people that were there witnessing some of the activity. Okay, They can flow down fairly quickly as well, 125 miles an hour. I think the YouTube videos here have uh, some backstory to this eruption, which is pretty interesting. Okay, Then uh, another volcanic hazard um, that can occur as a lahar. That's a, a fluid mud flow that you see pictured here. This can come at really fast or rates down the steep slopes uh, of a volcano. And it's just a lot of volcanic materials saturated in water. Remember, a lot of those composite cones have a lot of snowpack or glaciers at the top of them. Sometimes they can have lakes at the top of them. And if there's an eruption, all that water can come at a really fast rate um, down the, the volcano slopes. So those are very dangerous. Um, <clears throat> one notable eruption occurred in 1902 on the island of St. Pierre. Uh, and I'm sorry, St. Pierre is a, a town. Um, and uh, vol the volcano Mount Pel Pelé erupted. This is in the uh, Lesser Antilles, so just south of the Caribbean, kind of like off the coast of, uh, way off the coast of Colombia and Venezuela. Um, but there was a, a pyroclastic flow there that just eviscerated the entire town. Okay, so this was a bustling kind of Caribbean port town. Um, then after the pyroclastic flow, boom, this is what it looked like. Before, after, devastation. Every single person died except one, one guy, and that one guy happened to be incarcerated. So that's pretty crazy. He ended up being the uh, tour guide. Um, uh, I guess he was uh, uh, forgiven uh, from his crimes, and then he became the tour guide to show people the devastation of uh, what was left behind of St. Pierre. Um, then there's famously the uh, 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 eruption in Pompeii, 79 AD. Okay, that Vesuvius uh, erupted, created a huge eruption cloud, and so at first the, the eruption cloud kind of went upwards. Um, but then as that pyroclastic flow um, kind of reached, or the eruption cloud reached the same density as the air, then it came careening down and became a pyroclastic flow and followed the slopes uh, of the volcano um, into uh, the low-lying areas and including into, into Pompeii. And this uh, eviscerated essentially all the people in town. Um, and they died pretty instantaneously doing, uh, you know, last few things before they uh, keeled over and died and they've they've been preserved it took I mean the Romans just gave up on Pompeii they couldn't find it because it was buried in all kinds of ash like in hundreds of feet of ash and it rained kind of recently afterwards and that when you add water to recently erupted volcanic ash it kind of hardens it and so they couldn't dig to find the town they just kind of gave up on it so 17 centuries later archaeologists then dug around and actually found the lost city of Pompeii. And in it, um, you could see the remnants of, of people who, um, who died. Um, they were all kind of burned up, including children. Look how sad that is. Some people were like getting up like, oh, what's going on? And then pff, they got covered by that pyroclastic flow and, and cremated, essentially. These are uh, casts. So what they do is they pun punch holes in them. Uh, and then fill it up with plaster so they don't fall apart, so they can preserve these ancient Roman people. So volcanoes are very hazardous. All different types of things can happen when you live near a volcano. Um, you can have pyroclastic flows, like we just mentioned, uh, lava flows, lahar flows that can bury your town. You can have, volcanoes are kind of unsteady structures. You can have collapses and landslides. 
You can have a dome collapse and then a pyroclastic flow as a result of that. Bombs are shooting from the events. There are eruption clouds and ash can fall down uh, on your home and cover it like this. Um, a lot of the gases coming out from the fumaroles, uh, especially sulfur dioxide, can kill you. Here's a, a lava flow in Hawaii. Imagine uh, not being able to get to work because of lava. Okay, um, And then you can have acid rain. So uh, yeah, very dangerous living around volcanoes. Here are some more uh, examples of pyroclastic flows and how dangerous they can be. Um, Mount St. Helens erupted in, in 1980. This was uh, pretty devastating. And it came down the volcano at speeds of 60 miles an hour. And at, the gas was at temperatures of uh, 800 degrees Fahrenheit. So people who were in the way of this flow, uh, yeah, they were essentially burned alive. Okay. This Mount St. Helens had a lot of snowpack on top. Uh, it melted all that water and then created a lahar. Okay, um, and if you notice, look, that's the a regular sized person walking there. There's some big trees in the Pacific Northwest, and look how high this is the high water mark from the lava from the lahar. So if you're anywhere near this riverbank, you could have been swept away by all that water and mud and be buried alive. And that can happen. There was. Um, a town in Colombia called Nevado de Ruiz, and there was an eruption and then a subsequent lahar, and it buried the entire town, and approximately 25,000 people died as a result of this. So these hazards can be uh, extremely dangerous. Okay, so let's talk about some of the volcanic landforms. Um, calderas, uh, we meant, I mentioned that before, those are steep walled depressions at the summit, and they form via a collapse of the volcano, okay? Um, they're nearly circular, and they uh, exceed uh, one kilometer in diameter. That's what distinguishes them from craters. Okay. Uh, in that GIF, you can see how a caldera kind of forms, uh, a volcano forms, and then there's a kind of collapse, and then you see that structure that forms there. That's what it looks like in the um, kind of macro sense. Let's look at pictures. So here you have a volcano. Okay. Um, there's a major eruption that occurs, and it partially empties the magmatic chamber below. And so when that happens, the material above it sinks. Okay, And when you have that sinking material, it creates a depression on the surface, a low-lying area. This is the actual crater or caldera that's left behind. And oftentimes, um, these low-lying areas can fill up with water and then become a lake. Uh, and that's true of Crater Lake National Park. Okay, and that's in Oregon. Um, if you notice too, if you're if you're from if you're from any areas with volcanoes like Central America, Mexico, Guatemala, Costa Rica, or South America like uh, Peru or Chile, there are areas where there are a lot of volcanoes and there are a lot of lakes that are surrounding the volcanoes. A lot of times, the the origin of those lakes are former volcanoes and collapses uh, that form those kind of deep lakes. But it makes for a beautiful landscape. Um, other volcanic landforms that can show up um, are fissure eruptions and lava plateaus. Fissure eruptions are when um, a crack kind of opens up in the ground and then basalt comes pouring out. Okay, and it just essentially just floods an entire area and there's and it's just a big uh, deposit of of uh, uh, lava flows essentially. Here are pictures uh, from a lava flow, a fissure eruption in Hawaii. It was like, like a couple decades ago. And that's what the book uses. But here, uh, if you look at here, this GIF is a more recent fissure eruption that occurred in Hawaii uh, about two years ago. I don't know if you remember in the news, uh, uh, flanking Kilauea, there was some uh, recent activity. And a lava flows were just pouring out of these areas. And a lot of residential communities uh, were covered in lava. And people, a lot of people lost their homes. Um, this can happen on an even bigger scale than that. Um, in the past, I think about 16 million years ago, I, if I'm not right, I'll have to double check that. But the Columbia River Plateau, which is a place in Washington and Oregon, that entire area was covered by basaltic flows. Okay, so this can happen on, on uh, continents, and it happened here. So fissure eruption occurred and basalts poured out into this entire area that's in purple. These states are big. This is practically half of Washington and a quarter of Oregon. 
and this is where lava just poured out and covered this entire area okay and um, here the Paloese River happens to cut through an area where a lot of lavas were kind of uh, solidified and deposited um, and it's about a thousand feet deep that cut into this so um, not only did it cover this vast area but it's its thickness in some areas is about a thousand feet so that is an enormous volume of volcanic material kind of reaching the surface of the earth so we haven't seen anything like this uh, in uh, modern day uh, you know since humans have been around eruptions of this scale um, other volcanic landforms include volcanic pipes and necks pipes are kind of uh, conduits that connect to a magma chamber to the surface and so when a volcano kind of uh, wanes down in its activity and goes extinct the uh, the magma in the conduit kind of solidifies um, and that can leave behind these pretty cool structures this is uh, devil's tower in wyoming you can see these are kind of injections of uh, of lava basaltic lava are kind of moving upwards okay uh, and after erosion this is what's left standing so it's pretty pretty unique there's another in Shiprock, New Mexico. Here it is. It's the middle of the, of the desert. It's a 1700 foot tower, essentially. And so this is how it evolves. Here's the volcano, or what, what it used to be, right? And so after activities over, all this material erodes away, and what's left behind is a portion of the conduit, um, and that remains uh, like what you see here in Shiprock, New Mexico. Um, <clears throat> but most magma that's generated never really makes it to the surface um, because its viscosity is really high it often stagnates in the crust and it just sits there for thousands of years slowly cooling down and crystallizing and when that happens uh, that igneous body is called a pluton so that's an intrusive igneous rock that you find uh, deep within the earth and um, they're classified in terms of their shape whether they're tabular or sheet like or whether they're massive and there are large areas on the surface of the earth that are covered by these rocks one in particular and one that's very beautiful is Yosemite National Park which is seen here um, these are all intrusive igneous rocks that crystallize kilometers beneath the earth's surface and they only make they only kind of show up on the earth's surface after millions of years of erosion and uplift so um, the different types of uh, kind of tabular uh, intrusive uh, igneous uh, features um, dikes and sills okay dikes are tabular and discordant meaning they, they kind of move upwards in different directions like that um, sills are concordant or tabular so they kind of horiz they move horizontally through the crust and essentially it's just magma making its way in terms of dikes they're ma magma making its way towards the surface sills kind of take advantage of the horizontal weaknesses in, in existing country rock and uh, kind of solidify underground that way um, and so the best example of this are the palisade sill in new york and you can see that these cliffs of basalt uh, right on the um, i think it's the hudson river okay and you can see this exposed here that's the palisade sill okay and then i'll show you okay so here this is actually um, oh wow I showed you the same picture here here's Yos uh, Yosemite National Park and uh, this is what uh, millions of years ago this is what this area was like it was an active a volcanically active area um, there are many magma chambers below the surface some of them connected to vol active volcanoes as in this one here others have been solidifying for thousands of years never making it to the surface Dikes kind of help magma travel upwards and cut upwards like that. They can feed sills, which move in horizontally. All right, here's a fissure eruption. Here's that volcano. And over time, as, let's say, activity ceases, everything solidifies and cools down, here are your deep igneous plutons, intrusive igneous rocks, right? Granites, diorites, deep underground. And then what you're left behind with something, a feature like ship rock, an exposed dike, uh, some volcanic necks devil's tower over here but over time this stuff erodes away too and then there's there can be uplift and as it's uplifted uh, then those deep 
rooted plutons or intrusive igneous rocks are exposed at the surface and they're altered by running water or glaciers and then they can become uh, really beautiful areas like here in uh, the Sierra Nevada mountains in California. Okay, so where do vol volcanoes occur? Well, um, it's not random, that's for sure. Most volcanoes are located on the margins of ocean basins. Okay, so you can see that there in that <laughs> strange gif that kind of zooms in from Mount St. Helens. Uh, but all those little red dots are the locations of volcanoes. And if you notice, they're kind of on the western side of the Americas, and that's because there's subduction there. So that's near the margins of the ocean. The second group of volcanoes um, are found at deep ocean basins. And then the third you can find on the interior of continents. So we'll talk about all three types of volcanoes. Uh, volcanoes here. So here's what I'm talking about. At the, at most volcanoes are found uh, around the, the edge or surrounding the Pacific Ocean. Um, and that's because of subduction. Ocean plates are subducting under uh, other ocean plates or continental um, crust. And so that those subduction zones end up creating volcanoes on the overriding plate. We call this, this area here we call the ring of fire because of all the um, composite volcanoes that are associated with the convergent plate boundaries. So plate motion is what provides the mechanism by which mantle rocks melt to form magma, right? So you have downgoing ocean crust, okay? Um, and a lot of the um, uh, hydrous minerals uh, become really hot, release dewater, and release the volatiles in the asthenospheric mantle that lowers the mantle melting temperature. Those melts are generated and they start to buoyantly rise through the overriding um, lithosphere. Okay, And then most of those melts won't make it to the surface. They crystallize deep underground as intrusive igneous rocks, but some of them do make it to the surface and erupt at the surface at volcanoes. Okay, So that's at convergent plate boundaries. So you have a descending plate that lowers the mantle melting temperature in the uh, asthenospheric wedge here, okay, that magma rises up. And then you can have, uh, if, in the case of ocean plates, it'll create a volcanic island arc, like Japan, like the Lesser Antilles, like the Aleutian Islands. Or um, if the overriding plate is continental crust, then you'll have a uh, continental volcanic arc. And the Andes of South America are that example the volcanoes of Central America, the volcanoes in the Pacific Northwest, are uh, that's continental arc volcanism. So here's your example. Subducting ocean lithosphere, water driven from the rock uh, on the surface of the subducting plate creates melts in the mantle. They rise up. Most of it crystallizes here. Some of it erupts. In this case, this would be a volcanic arc, island arc. And then you get these beautiful volcanoes as a result. This is, these are, uh, this is a volcano in the Aleutian Islands off the coast of Alaska. Then um, this is where the majority of magma is generated in, at divergent plate boundaries. Um, here the lithosphere pulls apart, as you can see in this GIF. You have two ocean uh, plates that kind of move away from each other. And what happens here is then you have a stenospheric mantle rise as a result of that to fill the gap. And it decompresses and begins to melt. Uh, partial melting occurs and large quantities of fluid basalts are generated here and most of them crystallize uh, within the uh, ocean lithosphere as either gabbro or uh, basalt, but some of them will erupt at, in this rift valley at the bottom of the sea floor and form those pillow lavas. Okay, so here's where a lot of, a uh, huge volume of magma is generated in this kind of plate tectonic environment. So again, here's a divergent plate boundary. The magma chambers are really close to the surface in this case. Two plates kind of pulling apart and then you have decompressing mantle rising up in this area and partially melting. Uh, and this is Iceland's an example of an area that has, uh, uh, it's, it's also a hot spot, meaning there's a lot of um, uh, anomalously hot mantle rising there, creating even more magma, and it's um, essentially built up the entire island of Iceland. And then the last case here, uh, 
where there's a lot of igneous activity is um, when when there's intraplate igneous activity, where there's a, a mantle plume. Okay, um, this is uh, activity that can occur in the middle of a plate. So th this is not the norm. This is um, less common than divergent plate boundaries. But essentially, what happens is plumes of hot mantle, and they're kind of anomalously hot, will rise through the mantle. Right? It's kind of like, say, you have a friend who went to a state college in their dorm room, and they have like, oh, I've got a lava lamp, man. Yeah, it's like a, a diaper in a lava lamp. That's just a uh, material that's kind of rising. It's heated up by the lamp at the bottom. And then because it's heated up, then it creates a diaper and rises. Kind of like you see in this image here. OK, here you can see and how long it takes. It takes millions of years for these diapers to kind of rise up from. A lot of them are generated at the core mantle boundary and then rise up towards the surface and come into contact with either ocean or continental lithosphere. OK, and so these form volcanic regions called hotspots. The best example of this is Hawaii. Hawaii is on a hot spot. Iceland's also on a hot spot, but also a divergent plate boundary. The Galapagos Islands are a hot spot. Okay. Um, the Columbia River Plateau that we talked about, where those fissure eruptions occur, that was because of um, a rising mantle uh, diaper um, or super plume. And then Ye uh, Yellowstone National Park today, um, that's also a hot spot as well. So it's this type of igneous activity is associated with rising hot mantle plumes. Okay, so here's a, another cross section to see that. Here you have the, the rising mantle plume. This is kind of the head of the plume that where the most of the uh, melts are that hits the bottom of the ocean lithosphere in the case of Hawaii. Um, and then the melts kind of buoyantly, buoyantly rise through the overriding plate erupt at the bottom of the ocean, and so much of it erupts that it becomes a volcanic island. And that's why we have those volcanic islands in Hawaii. And that's why we have that ongoing activity in Hawaii, creating those magnificent shield volcanoes.